Hello class, welcome back to Writing 201. Today we will continue to discuss dialogue. Focusing more on um, high energy in not just conversation but a character's voice. It doesn't have to be a monologue for it to be really gripping. You just need it to really uh, be hot in terms of the level of how active uh, the conversation is. So the way to uh, really you know, dive into that energy to really make it come to life off the page is to think about your personal experience in high tense situations. So let's say you are a chief battalion for uh, a fire department. You know, when you, when you, I, I don't know what that's like. I know someone who, uh, who did do that for a living and uh, he said it, it's it always it's always a high pressure situation where you're the one that has to put out the fire and you're organizing everything telling everyone what to do making sure that the victims of this fire are safe and so, are you know calmed down as this horrible situation is developing so that really made me think about uh how do you create that kind of energy, that kind of tension of all of this chaos going on around you and you have all these different levels of not just energy but ways of acting in the, in the situation, you know. The Chief Battalion is trying to stay in charge and direct people and keep the the victims calm, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. Uh, but if that's not the kind of job you have, think about it just, you know, personal disputes you've had like you and your girlfriend had a fight and it went you know for hours and even through the night and it just kept going and the next day it was you know a different energy in the house those kinds of things where it just sticks with you you remember how 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 heated and tense it was those are the kinds you think about when you're creating that that kind of uh, not just dialogue, but those kinds of moments in, in your story. It doesn't have to be just dialogue, but that's our focus for today. So when you are doing probably that kind of scene of a couple fighting, think about that, but not just yourself, you know, other people. It's like I said in the other video in regards to dialogue, that it's not just about what you experience, but what others experience as well, whether you know them or not. So before I ramble on more examples here, I'm going to show you an example of uh, high energy in a conversation. So for the example that I'm doing, it is from my book again, Boone and Jack, South and Secret, book one, and which, uh, let's see here, sorry. Daunton is the one starting the conversation. Oi! What did the dirty man say? He kept fixing his tie and patting his elbow, <laughs> patting his eyebrows, while waiting for Jacques to answer him. Jacques let go of the rope and fished out the torn piece, pieces of the envelope. He presented it to Daunton and said, Mr. Crom said, Tell Daunton he can eat his invitation and I'll see him Monday. Dunton looked at him in utter disbelief and smacked the torn pieces of the invitation out of his hand. As he flew up in the air, Jack rubbed his hand. Dunton ignored the pieces falling all over the bathroom and grabbed a phone off the wall outside of the bathroom door. He dialed, vexed and determined to put a stamp on his position of power. The phone rang a few times before a groggy hello came out just loud enough for Jack to hear was a woman. He had never actually met Boone's mother. Hello, madam. This is Daunton Donnelly calling. Owner of Cronker Button Factory. Is Crom there? Hold on a second. Cromay! Some man named Daunton Donnelly wants to talk to you. Tell that rich prick he can suck a... Jane cut him off before Daunton could hear that nasty word. He can't come to the phone right now. Daunton huffed and said, What a bewailing fortune. In that case, tell him if he doesn't come tonight. 
to my party with his boy, he can say goodbye to his supervisor position and be thrown in with the workers. Oh, and feel free to come along. You sound like a delightful and formidable woman. So, you see right there, he is not, it doesn't sound chaotic, but there is a lot of uh, heat behind what he's saying. Do you understand? Like he's he's holding his tongue to woo um, Boone's mother so that she can convince uh, Boone's father to to come to the party because he still wants this sense of I'm in control, and in order for him to do that, he has to make sure that he plays both the gentleman in the very sneaking, grimy way that he's doing, but also still assert his dominance. So he does that here very, uh, uh, by saying a compliment to, to Jane and then also kind of giving a little sting to, to Crom, Boone's father, threatening to uh, take his position away. And um, we also get a sense of the dynamic between uh, Boone's dad and Boone's mom when uh, she calls for him very loudly. Kwame! Kwame! Has a phone! <laughs> so that's it for that example. Uh, as for how you can translate your personal uh, situations that you can reflect on or pull from. The way to do that without copying or replicating the the line for line argument you had, which would be really distasteful to do that to an ex or a current partner, is to not make it about you. Make it about the character. It, does, it doesn't mean that you uh, Ignore the, ignore your life. You just pull the energy from that conversation and translate it to what is currently going on in the story, like at that point. Because it's not about copying what you take from life. It's about taking the pieces that work best for the story. Which I know sounds kind of <laughs> sociopathic, but it, it just works for, for, for storytelling. Because the way it helps us writers with, uh, with storytelling is that it's, comes, it comes from a real place. That's really it. That's, that's what dialogue is. It comes from a real place. Even if you write something extremely, you know, high fantasy, very fantastical. So, here's another example of, uh, one second, about that, I grabbed the wrong book. I, uh, I was really thinking about the, like, conclusive part of, uh, series of unfortunate events. Series of unfortunate events. Come on, Andre, open your mouth. Uh, this is book 12, The Penultimate Peril. So, one of the things I always loved about this series is how alive these characters feel. Like it's 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 a ju juvenile style of writing because it's meant for a younger audience. But even to this day, the the way Count Olaf was created and how he comes off the page is very charismatic in an evil way. If that makes any sense, like here, just listen to this little monologue he does. Uh, towards the end of the story. I'll, I'll start with uh, how Lemony Snicket describes his eyes. His eyes had never gleamed as brightly and his smile had never been as peccant. A word which here means so hungry for evil deeds as to be unhealthy. 
It was not unlike the face of Dewey had been as he sank into the water, as if the villain's own wickedness was causing him great pain. He won't be the only volunteer who dies today, he said in a terrible whisper. I'll destroy every soul in his hotel, sugar bowl or no sugar bowl. I'll unleash the medusoid mycelium, and volunteers and villains alike will perish in agony. My comrades have failed me as often as my enemies, and I'm eager to be rid of them. Then I'll push that boat off the roof, and I'll sail away with... And then uh, Violet interrupts him there, but you see that it, it, it's, it's not long, but it's, it's, it's so eerie, it's so... Like, he's lost his mind. He's, he's so broken from all of these trial and errors of trying to get the Baudelaire fortune. And he's just like, Ugh, I just, why can't I have what I want? Just give me what I want! Is, is what I pick up, I, I get from this, this moment here. And there are other moments where he's like that, but this is like his breaking point. So, <laughs> how do you do that? How do you find that sort of, you know, I call it the, the frustrated angry bear anger. Do you know, you know what that is? It's like, if you've ever seen a bear just seething with anger when it's staring at a human or an animal, it's just like, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's drooling for, for, for that satisfaction of its own anger and, and hunger so so how do you how do you find that in dialogue how do you how do you put that in there so the way I've done it is I've just remembered being able to read someone that's really how I've been able to to put that into writing is how how can you see through someone that's really the art of, of dialogue, is seeing through what someone is actually saying. So let's say you have a boss that you know is quite passive, and then one day they just snap. The way that can help you is that you, you start to understand that everyone has their way of protecting themselves, but everyone has their breaking point, meaning we're human. No matter what we do in life, whether it's our profession or uh, how we present ourselves to other people, there comes a point where someone says something or does something that pisses you off so much that you just, bah, just, nah, nah, I got, just snap. So when you understand that, that's how you can, you can create those, those peaks of energy. And how you can kind of pepper that in to conversation. Not just one person's uh, line or piece of dialogue, but throughout the whole conversation. Uh, I was going to give you an example of it by Stephen King. When, when Pennywise starts to show his fear, and, his own fear and frustration. But the book is like 1,100 pages and I, was, I didn't have time to, to go digging through all those pages. But... What I remember from that story, more so than the than the movie adaptations or mini TV series, is that Pennywise, when he's talking, it's not just about him feeding off of these kids' fears. It's also trying to keep them from giving him a taste of his medicine. But that happens. Spoiler alert. So when that happens, we get to see as, as readers and as an audience that he's scared as hell. You know, he thought that that was his power, that he was able to play mind games, to keep people at bay, to keep them away from his own um, weaknesses. Because believe it or not, he does have them. It's very hard to find because he is a monster. He is basically immortal. So how, how do you defeat darkness, right? So that's, that's something to chew on. Uh, lastly, for dialogue, what I want to leave you with, really, is when you're thinking about 
how do I make these characters real? And how do I do that through dialogue? Just like I said, it all comes down to what have you been, th been through in life? What has really, you know, shaken you to your core? Is it the death of a loved one? Was it some huge fight you had with the loved one? Or your life partner, a sibling, co-worker, boss? I don't know. I mean, everyone's had one more than once. We've all had those moments more than once. And those are the moments that we had to think about. Not in the sense that we dwell on what hurt us or who hurt us, but what's stuck in our heads. So really think about that. Di dialogue can be really personal, but it shouldn't come off that way. Like it shouldn't come off as you as the author putting in your personal issues, like verbatim, and then just saying, here, take my pain. No, 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 it's here. This is the character's pain, not mine. It may be kind of tied, tied into mine or loosely based on mine, but it's not my pain and it's not my life. It's their life. Remember that, okay? That's very important. You are creating a new life. It's not yours, okay? It's the character's life. So when you're writing dialogue, make sure it has to do with who they are as a person, not who you are as a person. Okay? If I forgot anything, please leave some questions in the comments below or in my social media. Alright? Have a good day and happy reading. Bye. Find your rhythm. Find your rhythm.